I can't believe it, but today I have what People Magazine has rated as the number one most recognized actor and my childhood hero, Gary Brown. You're from Idaho, right? Nope. Iowa. Iowa. Isn't that where Radar from MASH was supposedly the fictional? I have no idea. The fictional character from MASH yeah, was... It's possible. Was my, from... My dad left uh, Sioux City um, when I was like a half, six months or eight months old and moved to Los Angeles to go to USC. Uh -huh. So I never... I've been to Iowa and met a lot of my relatives, but it's only like, you know, for... Three or four hours you go and you say hi yeah, yeah we're yeah, in california yeah. and you're here yeah. bye <laughs> yeah <laughs> but they're nice people i like yeah. iowa except in the winter it's not so very you haven't nice been there much it now in florida in california it's it's like what today like probably in the 72 70s. yeah about 70. probably 70s mm -hmm. 70. we we live close to the desert but it's not desert so it's not Real, real hot. But once in a while, we get maybe 104, 105. So where did you say you were from in California again? Valencia. Valencia. It's up in just before the mountains in the far side of Los Angeles, as if you were going to San Francisco. So so you're so you're not like on the route to Las Vegas, right? No, Las Vegas is out is that, the other way. The other way, yeah. In, into the States. When I was in Las Vegas, I always saw that sign that said, Los Angeles, a hundred miles. I always, be, yep. Valencia would be one of the first places you you hit. Wouldn't be the very first, but probably within the first ten little cities in there, because everybody has their own little city, and they're basically yeah. housing divisions where a developer would come and he'd build maybe eight, nine, yeah. maybe a thousand houses, sell them, and then go up to the next big lot and do the yeah. same thing. Where it's, or it's real flat. Very flat. flat. But the mountains are. Probably 40 minutes away, and we're pretty much surrounded by mountains, except if you're going into L.A., and that's where it kind of it's, flattens it's, out. It's really like here, you're staying at, with Alan Jones, right, mm -hmm. at, at Creekside? Yeah. Creek Ridge. Whatever. <laughs> you, yeah. Whatever you say, I'll say yes, because <laughs> I don't know. I don't know it's a, the boy, isn't is. that a nice place? It's beautiful. He is really a nice guy. He he texted me last night and said, "You and him were watching the ball game." Yep, we're having a good time, relaxing with the ball game. He's really smart, isn't he, Alan? Seems to be. He is. I didn't give him any tests, but he seems to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you, it, would you like the weather here in Tennessee, or would you? I mean, it's just too too. And you're here on a bad day. It's yeah. dreary, right? Well, where I live is on the the kind of the outskirts of the desert. There's Los Angeles. And there's mm -hmm. quite honestly quite a bit of smog in Los Angeles, just because of all the cars. Yeah. But where I live, the mountains are here, and they pretty much surround the whole place. But the smog doesn't really get that far. So we have very very fresh air. But if you have to go into town, or, or you know, it it's not the best place for your lungs. See, I can't imagine that. I, I would, I couldn't imagine it being so thick you could see it or smell it. That, well, you can smell it. You can't really see it because it's, you know, it's, but it's heavy. I mean, you can, you just get a heavy feeling because it's, it's like when just before it rains, but it's like that all the time. So if if I was in, living in California, mm -hmm. I would think to myself more about this uh, pollution and global warming and effects on the earth. Than I do in Tennessee. I'm thinking, what are they talking about, right? Well, let's see. Where where we live in Los Angeles, we're not close, but close enough that basically most of it gets pushed out into the ocean, which is kind of sad. But we're right mm. there, and then the, the winds yeah. come over the mountains, down through the, the hills, yeah, and pushes it all out to the sea. I see. So we have really where I am, very good air. What do you do normally during the day? Watch TV, go out and garden, maybe. Talk to my wife. I mean, she always has something for me to do. <laughs> he likes watching the news. Now, y'all, y'all met what in nineteen? What, what's it like? 
the most glaring question is, what's it like? Did, did you ever, did you grow up watching the Beaver? I did. Did you have any idea that you would end up being married to Not him? at all. No. <laughs> Can you I imagine that? I got very lucky, let me tell you. So I don't, uh, I don't even worry about that because it was just luck. Yeah. Our sisters were very good friends and I should have figured this out as a bachelor, but people, women can find better women than men. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean your sisters? My, my, I have, Our, my, I have a sister and that they knew her. Oh, they knew her. And so, so you already knew him. Well, no, our sisters knew each other. They raised their kids in the same area. Oh, so it's not like growing up you knew them. No, 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 no. And so they figured I have a lot of experience behind the camera, uh -huh. uh, producing for quite a few years and coordinating and all. So they thought this would be a good mix because he's in front of the camera. I'm. Used Did you to know that they him. knew him? Yes, yes. So yeah, we're a good we're a good match. Well, it seems. What? Well, tell me what it's like, though. I mean, do you can you separate him from the TV show? Oh sure. Because I'm having Absolutely. a hard time doing that. Well, we have a really simple life, uh -huh. and um, what's really incredible is that Jerry goes around the country. We travel together. Mm -hmm. And he does autograph shows, mm -hmm. and the fans are so excited to meet him because he grew up in their living room. So mm -hmm. they feel like they know him, mm -hmm. and we've had people cry. We've had people, they're speechless, and it's Sometimes such a, it's a little scary. <laughs> it's such, well, it's, it's such a testament to how important this show was to and continues mm -hmm. to be. For it's one, so many it's one of the longest running shows in te television history because it's never been off the air since uh, basically 1957. And uh, it plays all over the world. It plays in about 30 countries. So I speak all these languages with 30 uh, countries. 30 countries all over the world. And some of them it leaks over because some of the communist ones they, they can't show it, but the people that live close to the border can show it. Isn't that so, when you say it's, do some people get so starstruck that it is sort of scary? Not really, yeah. because they're 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 not in any way that they're they make me feel uncomfortable. They're just so happy to see you. It's like if you haven't seen your parents, if or your dad may have been yeah. away on a trip or something. Yeah. They're, they're just so happy to see me, and I just kind of go, you know, it's fun. I like them. They're nice people, and they're. You know, they say, I watch you, I get up every morning and I watch you and I brush my teeth and go to work. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's <laughs> fine with me. <laughs> also, too, what was really interesting, especially during the pandemic, mm -hmm. is a lot of people recorded the show in the morning and they watch it at night because it's peaceful and they can go to sleep with feeling good and uh -huh. knowing that they're watching something that has a lot of value and sensitivity and we hear that a lot, yeah. that people watch the show before they go to sleep at night to have a peaceful rest. Who did the intro? Wouldn't have the foggiest idea. Yeah. That music is... is the music weird. is good, but and there's also you know, the guy that that's talks over him, but you never meet those people. Those are people that just... So you don't, you don't know who did the, wrote the, no. the jingle, I guess you'd call it. No. Well, it's a song, um, Toy Band. Toy Parade. They're, Toy Parade. Toy Parade. The, yeah. the, the music is, is also, it's called Toy Parade. And right. then they put the lyric to it for Leave it to Beaver. Now, when Leave it to Beaver came out, it ruined that song for anything other than Leave it to Beaver. Well, it certainly I think they bought it. I think they, they bought it. They found it and bought it. And then it was something that we owned, and that's why it, it always plays. Right. Well, it's it's a, it's the one of the mo I guess it's the most iconic song there is besides maybe Happy Days. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. They, they did a lot of work. I remember when we were first going on, they were looking all over for what would be the theme song because you know that's what 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 the show starts and mm -hmm. ends with. Yeah. So they it took them a while to find it. I'll tell you. Now, one thing about it is is um, in the beginning of the show. In the orig in the first season, they had Hugh Beaumont telling what the show was mm -hmm. going to kind of be about and what kids were learning, and they stopped that about the second season. Wonder why they did that? Just no idea. But they, you know, somebody probably said, "Oh, you know, that this would be better." Yeah. 
Um, you know, there were two, Conley and Moser were the, uh, the writers. Uh, Joe Conley and, and Bob Moser. Bob Moser. And they were the, they were the, the head, the head honcho. So whatever they did, you, you know, you did, it didn't matter. They said, this is what we're going to do this year. Then that's what you did. So they, they, they were, they, they were in charge. They were in charge. And no question about it. But they were the producers and the writers. So they knew what they had written. They knew how they wanted it to flow. And sometimes they'd come back and they'd say, you know, that scene we did yesterday, and that's not what we wanted. We wanted it to kind of move this way or that way. And then we'd go back and do it again. So, so when you originally did, had they written other sh shows? Amos and Andy. They were the first. Uh, I don't know if they were the first, but they were the main writers of. Uh, well, that was funny. Amos and Andy. Boy, that was funny. So they had a lot of experience. Did they write go to write other stuff later? Um, they did. I can't remember because, exactly what um, it was. Did they do the Munsters? They did the Munsters. The Munsters. Yeah. yeah, the Munsters and a couple other shows like that. But I mean, the, their biggest hit from the time that they started working was Leave it to Beaver. Now, they may have done some after I left. I don't know. I, I noticed that sometimes I was watching a Petticoat Junction mm -hmm. the other night, and and Eddie Haskell was on the show. Ken Osmond, yes. And the funny part was what he really did, he wasn't really a full-time actor. He was a motorcycle cop. So can you imagine but, you're driving along this? Yeah, Eddie Haskell, Ken Osmond. Ken Osmond was Officer Osmond of the Los Angeles Motorcycle. While he was on the show, while he was on the show, and he would get because they do That'd get freak out. Yeah. They, they, they do get the um, uh, time off, you know, for vacations, and that's when we would get him. And so he would, we would stack all the things he was going to do and do like a week for the whole year, and do him because he could only get that vacation for a few days. That so was, how old was he? That was for the new Leave It to Beaver. For the new Leave It to not Beaver, the old, not, not, not the, the old. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the the steal the beaver. He was the oldest of us all. He was, I don't know, but probably in his uh, early twenties by the time he was doing the the end of the show. But not in the beginning. No, in the beginning. Because in the beginning, he just had a couple of appearances, but they started showing him more. And, and well, more. everybody liked him so much. People, he was, you know, he was getting a lot of fan mail, and people realized that he was a very integral part of the show and every the, the, what they always say is everybody knows an Eddie Haskell and they're like sometime or other you're going to meet a guy like Eddie Haskell what makes people what makes some actors integral like that I mean it just it just sticks or something people relate it to, or something yeah, yeah people you know have a an idea of what every actor and should be like the beavers a little boy and very innocent uh, Wally's his big brother, but knows a lot more about the world, and Eddie Haskell's the yeah. kind of guy you want to stay away from. <laughs> it, it, I guess it is that people can relate, right? Yeah, they, you know, people do. They, they like Leave it to Beaver because a lot of those things happen to them. It may not have been exactly like what we did on the show, but they can say, oh, yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I did that, and oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, but it was fun. I've always thought that Leave it to Beaver was more of a show where, where they, uh, it was sort of being told or watched through, through what Beaver would see. Yeah, Does that was, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that it was meant to be that way. It was the world through an eye, the eyes of a child. Even though he was in the scene, it was his perception. Right. What what he thought should be happening, and um, you know what did happen. Uh, it's sometimes different, but that's what. You know, a, a child's view of the world. Now, do you remember Gus? Gus the fireman. The fireman. Bert Mustin was his name. Bert Mustin. He, he was, was on Andy Griffith. Well, he's in a lot of things, but what he really did, and he was hard to get, was he was a real estate agent. <laughs> he was a million dollar real estate agent. When I say million dollars, he was selling every year around a million dollars worth of, uh, that was a lot, then, of right? real estate. Yeah, well, in Los Angeles, it's not that many, but it's, it'll definitely keep you busy. Yeah. So he, we had trouble getting him. We'd, we'd want him for a show, and sometimes we'd have to wait six or eight weeks before he could kind of line people up and be able to do it. Also, he started his career at 65 years old. 
65 he years old. He had all kinds of other careers. Well, yeah, but re real estate was his big thing, but he was a, and he started a big at real estate man. So there's... Now, did would he get paid a lot for that, or would it be more of a hobby? A... I think it was more of a hobby. I mean, it was very good pay I mean, in, in the hundreds of dollars um, for, you know, a day's work, and he might work you know, three or four days a week on the show and then go back and sell real estate on Thursday, Friday, Monday, or a Saturday and Sunday and then go back. Did you know him personally? I mean, like like a good friend or was yeah. he? It, it, it's probably more like a, a teacher, but, but you had more time to be with them because there's not a, you know, there's not 30 other kids wanting to talk to him. I mean, it was just he and I. And you know, when we had a scene, I'd go up there and go to his dressing room and my mom would be there and um, he'd read his lines, and I'd read mine, and he might say something to me like, oh, you know, that one you should leave a little more of a break for, or you should change that one a little bit. And He was a very nice man. Did you have cue cards, or did you have this memory? Just memories. And it, it wasn't that hard. I mean, it wasn't anything. You know, I've been doing that since I was started on live TV at two years old. So it wasn't anything that was hard for me to. It's probably like you going to first grade and learning how to read by second grade. It wasn't any big deal. <laughs> right. Your mom helped you. Yeah, my mom helped me. She she would read it to me, and then I just memorized it. But you have to have some natural talent in there that somebody saw. Obviously, Absolutely. right? And he has never had an acting lesson. So it was totally natural, which is incredible. It was just easy. I mean, it wasn't anything. Were you that... being more yourself? Would you say that, that Beaver was more like you than 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 then maybe we realize maybe it wasn't that hard to act that it was more you. It was me, but it was me because they were watching me and taking things that I did and putting them in. I mean, they were just little things, but a lot of things, you know, that my mom or my dad might they'd say, what did Jerry do that? And they'd say, oh, he did this. And then three weeks later, that was in the show. But you wouldn't have known it. You'd have thought it was just yeah. something. That, because it was things that were really happening. It was that way with all the people on the show. That was what the show was, was, it was supposed to be things that had happened. An all-American <clears throat> family. Do you remember uh, Marta on Lost in Space? She was actually, I like to watch the different shows and see the actors that crossed over, like seeing Eddie Haskell on Petticoat Junction mm -hmm. and seeing Wally on Father Knows Best. Remember he was on, he went to their house for something. Yeah. Well, that was we we used to shot thirty nine a year for six years, but that would only take about uh, eight months, nine months sometimes. Mm -hmm. So then then you had a time off, and if you wanted to go work on another show, they didn't care because it didn't really matter. You weren't you weren't saying he was Wally, he was Tony Dow playing whatever name he had on that show. Yeah. So it was you know it was a lot of fun, and we knew all, most of those people because we'd go to all sorts of things you know during the. the the breaks in the show, and so we knew all those people. So it was just fun to go and be with them. It's sort of a like in the construction business. You talk to the roofer and the brick black brick mason. They also work on that job over here, mm -hmm. and they work on that job. And the reason they do is because we know. So it becomes a a a a, a circus or a thing that. You you got to be there to be to be involved, I guess. Yeah, if you know if you're not there, there, there's a lot of people that want that job. So you have to be very good at it because there's people that are very good at it that are going to take the job if you don't. Now, if somebody went to California today and just sat on the stool and just tried to get in, it probably wouldn't work because it, TV's not like that anymore, is it? Well, it's a little bit different, but you know, if they were good, it depends. I mean, you know. It you have to have a lot of skills. I mean, people say, oh, yeah, he's a sound man. Well, to be a sound man takes a lot of work to be able to know exactly where all the different machines need to be at a certain time and how, how close that mic has to be. But it can't show on the TV. It can't show on the screen. And but lighting. And lighting. You know, there's probably you know, 10, 15 people just on lighting in a, in a big TV show. And uh, the cam you know, we got a camera guy here and the lights, and I always wonder, I always think the lights are too bright, and then I, and then I think they're not dark enough. You never know. You never know until you see them, and it's too late, right? It's too late. But now you can kind of adjust it a little bit. Yeah, you always could a little bit, but sometimes you need a lot. 
and you only get a little bit. <laughs> now, did you have a, you had what a brother and a sister? I have three brothers and a sister. Three were were any of them get into acting? They did, but not not a whole lot. Um, my my brothers are all sheriffs. Sheriffs. Yeah, my oh, my one brother is a director of photography, and my other two brothers are sheriffs. In in California, in Los Angeles, yeah. Also, Jerry's sister Susie uh, sometimes was in some of the background scenes of yeah. Leave It to Beaver. She's is that right? Yeah, she's a mayor. She's the mayor of of hers in uh, San Fernando Valley. San Fernando Valley. Yeah. yeah. Um, the mayor of San Fernando Valley. Well, uh, it's one of the the suburbs. San one Fernando the, Valley is a huge yeah. place, and she is a certain place in it that she's the mayor of. Is there many in that town? I would think probably. Yeah, there is, but yeah. you don't know how many. I, I have like, no idea. Like Twenty thousand or probably hundred thousand. Between no more, like between ten and fifteen, probably. But there are huge places. I mean, they're all two and three acre houses, and so it's uh, a lot of them are not not agricultural, but the people have horses on the property if they're big enough. Mm -hmm. More of a gentleman. Farm, General sort of farmers would be the way it's up kind of in it's flat for a little ways and then it goes up into the hills and most of the, the ranches are on the in the hilly part of it. But they're think, not all hilly. <laughs> do you think that when you quit, you wanted to go back to high school, right? Yeah, I, well, because I'd never been in school with the kids. I had a private tutor. Now they were very good. They picked the best teachers of the LA Unified School District for that uh, grade, uh, you know, and I would have her as my only teacher. But you know, I never had. I never went out and played any sports because I was working. I worked from basically eight to five or nine to six every day, and I'd go home, study my lines, and come back the next day and do it again. What's well, a whole other, whole different world, isn't it? It is a different world, and it was fun. I mean, yeah. they they knew that for kids, I mean, with adult actors, they know what they're getting into. But with kids, you know, if a kid doesn't want to do it, it's very hard to make them. So. They made it fun, you know. My, they'd have the the carpenters, and I would build boats, and we'd do all sorts of things just to keep me amused. I mean, I, I went to school. I had a private tutor, mm -hmm. and they would pick for whatever grade I was in one of the best teachers in the LA Unified School District, which is a huge school district, and she was my teacher. And I wouldn't be in school with anybody else unless one of the other kids was in that particular show, and then they'd take off and they'd be. They'd bring their books from their school, but uh, so I would have my own private teacher, and it was very good. I'm a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, so it was a good education. What did you graduate in? Philosophy. Well, that can get deep, don't you? think all philosophy comes from Horace? Uh, it's possible. You know, it's, it's, it's just something that I like. So it's something that when you start studying it, you read what one person said and another person, they don't really sometimes jive, but it's just interesting to see how their minds were working, you know, 100 years ago or maybe even more than that. Or even 50, or even now. Yeah. Do you think the minds has been a lot different, or, or is it about the same, of course? Well, I think nowadays we have a lot more technology, which makes your mind have to work more. I mean, people don't think about it, but 100 years ago, Nobody watched television. What is your mind seeing now? What would it be doing? Reading? Yeah. I don't guess it'd even be reading. A lot of people couldn't read. I mean, you know. Boy, that's right. So it, We think, what did they read? They couldn't read. Yeah, because they didn't, there was no, you know, the, all, the, the rich people went to school, but a lot of people were out, you know, in the farms and things, and they did all the work. And it, it's, it's interesting to see how our nation has changed. Think about that. They didn't. I haven't even. That's not even really dawned on me. They didn't even read. Mm -hmm. That was how long ago? Maybe fifty years, sixty, seventy-five years ago, probably. And a lot of people do. I'm not saying that they were all not reading. Most a lot of people certainly read. not a hundred years ago, no. two hundred years ago. No. But they, you know, but everything is like that. Things change. You just never know. You know, you you go someplace and you learn something, and you come out, and people go, "Where'd you? How did? How did you know that?" I don't know. I learned that at school. Well, I didn't learn that at school. I don't know. I think that's what they taught yeah. me. Yeah, you're almost handicapped. On, we're handicapped on the stuff that we don't even know that we're handicapped on, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I always, it was always lucky for me because I, mean, I was studying scripts, so I had a, a mind that was adjusted to listening to people say something and giving an answer. Well, when you're in a schoolroom, that's what the teacher tells you something. 
you find the answer and give it to her, and then you basically move on. Mm -hmm. So it's a really help for me. Now, did Hugh, Hugh Beaumont, he, he went to Chattanooga here for school. Well, he was actually, when he was doing Leave it to Beaver, a Methodist minister. So he would not retire. I don't know what you'd call it, but he um, withdrew so he could do the show so that and he would go to some of the very, very poor congregations that couldn't afford a minister and work there on like Saturdays and Sundays and then come back and be Hugh Beaumont or you know, wasn't he in the first? Wasn't he Michael Shea in the originally? And that was something he wasn't embarrassed by, but he's a minister. And Michael Shane is Shane, yeah, is a person that when you walk up to him, if you're a, a bad guy, he takes you by your shirt and goes boom, boom, boom. <laughs> what are you going to do? So I think when he got to leave it to Beaver, he was a lot happier that that was something that he could really kind of enjoy doing because it was something that was fun for him. He almost, you almost felt like that that was his ministry. That, that's in, what in I a mean. Sense. In a sense, it was because he was the boys telling the boys, you know, you did this, but if you'd have done this, nothing would have happened. But you did that on the way. Right. And so you're going to have to pay the consequences. And that's what Leave to Beaver is all about. That's you... what it's all about. Do you think that, that the writers and directors had that in mind? Or do you think no. Hugh Beaumont brought that to it? It wasn't Hugh Beaumont. It was the writers, but Hugh Beaumont was one of the writers, and he um, directed some of them, and he also wrote a few of the shows. But uh, the two writers between them had 16 kids, so they knew a lot about how kids but thought you, and what they were But you think doing. they were trying to bring a wholesome thing to TV? That's what they wanted. They wanted a show that the whole family could watch, because at that time, there was a lot of you know the, the shoot 'em up shows and cowboy shows and all these things. They wanted a show about an American boy living in their time um, and, and what the things that could happen. And they took a, a lot of the things were things that happened to their kids or the other parents that say, you know what my kid did? And then three weeks later, a little part might be something that that parent had said. Well, that's interesting because that's what I get out of the show. But I always wondered if that was on purpose or... Let me tell you about Capstar Bank. They're located in Nashville, Hendersonville, Gallatin, Athens, Madisonville, Sweetwater, Etowah, and in Cleveland at 950 25th Street and 3855 North O'Coy Street. I've used them. I like them. Give them a try. They're no problem. Mayfield was set in the sub... You know, it, the town was supposed to be set in the suburbs of Mayfield. What was it the suburbs of? It didn't say, right? No, Mayfield was the entire, in other words, there would have been probably an, uh, uh, all its stores and everything in that part of Mayfield. And in Los Angeles, that's what they do. They build housing tracks. Mm. And they also build a couple, uh, you know. What they call bedroom communities or bedroom something? Bedroom communities, yeah. yeah. So you can drive yeah. and they're usually fairly yeah. close to a freeway so that people can work there, but get on a freeway and go to work. Mm. That's always been, the fans always talk about, where's Mayfield? Yeah. yeah. You know, and they wanted it to be anywhere USA because it was a So a they family. never really said, you'll, you'll never see things like, you know, right. New York Street <clears throat> or anything like that. Well, that's the same, what, same way with uh, Father Knows Best. It was never really said, we just sort of knew it was out west somewhere. Yeah. But if, if but if that was supposed to be set in Ohio, Ohio is they have a lot of our accents. I mean, it Ohio is not that far. They they're more like us than than California is to us, I guess. Mm -hmm. But they just they didn't want it. Never snows there. Um, it it, it rains. Right, but it never right, snows. Never snows. So people would say, well, then it can't be there. It can't yeah. be there. It's Los Angeles. You know, it has to be the West Coast because that's the only place that you know they still do everything and it never snows. Why did they move from one house to the, you know, the second episode, yeah. they moved houses? Well, it wasn't the second episode. Maybe this. It was about, it was went on for a while because the, the studios changed. Review bought uh, Universal, which was a huge studio that had been 
working since. But why didn't they leave the same house? See, that misses me. Up. Well, because it's a ha it was really a house. Now we had sets. Oh. But in the back lot, it was really a house, and that was on a different studio that was probably thirty miles from the first studio. So they would have had to put it on a trailer and <clears throat> dragged it over there. So, so they, they so they wrote it in to show that we moved. That they're moving. <laughs> it was much cheaper. <laughs> Now, Teresa, what were you doing when you met him? Um, I was working for a um, a charity that helps seniors, and from um, California from also. California, yeah. I have a lot of public relations background and coordinating background, so that's what I was doing at the time that we met. Yeah, and he what was it? What was it? What was the first thing that was said? Hi. Well, here, <laughs> this is this is a great story. So. He wasn't sure if this was going to work out, so he decided, we, we got on the phone and we had a great conversation. Well, our, our sisters knew each other. Our, our sisters knew each other. And they said... Well, that, were they trying to set you up? Yeah, they both yeah. said, this is the perfect person to both of us. Because you, you, you'd been married before, right? Yes. Or, uh, he practiced twice. A practice, yeah. But, yeah. Um, Three times charm. Yeah, yeah there so you go. There she is. Um, but what was really funny is we decided to do go to lunch. So he... Mm -hmm picked his favorite restaurant for lunch. Which was what? Um, it was the Smokehouse in Toluca Lake, California. And he figured if if the lunch didn't go well, that at least he had his favorite meal. And I thought that was pretty brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, and then the rest is history because we hit it off immediately. Well, so after that, how did y'all date a while? We did. We dated a long time, um, probably a year. Four, no, probably about four years or so before we got married. So you were already doing your thing. Oh yeah. Before I he had, came along. Oh sure. I had about thirty-five years oh. in production, mm -hmm. and I had never been married before. So um, I'm very blessed because he has three wonderful children, mm -hmm. and we now have five grandchildren under the age Golly. of seven. They're under the age of, of seven, and they're so much fun. Boy, it is a lot of work, isn't it? She says fun. I say work. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just so grateful because I didn't know I would ever have that opportunity. Where was your family? Where was your parents from? Actually, I lived in pretty much the same, really close to where he uh, lived up. also. Like 20 minutes or five minutes? Not five minutes, but probably more like twenty or thirty. We both lived so in so like here to Udawa or something. Udawa, I, I don't know where. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like twenty minutes away. Okay, we yeah. We both lived in the San Fernando Valley. Yeah, just big, ironically, it's, we did. It's a big valley, but it's yeah. not that big. Yeah. But 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 after after Beaver after about the what were you, how it was six years right six years yes. So then you go to school. Is it is it over? You're just a regular kid. Um, pr pretty much so, because I was on the football team. So all my friends, um, we all went in as freshmen, and so all my friends and all my classes were. And it was a, a a private boys' school, Notre Dame High School. How many in that class, roughly? Probably thirty, thirty-five. But you know, everybody that was on the football team knew each other, so. Mm -hmm. Nobody gave me any problems. You know, I, I know other people that are child actors that had to go to a regular school had problems because people would come up and tease them. And you don't tease somebody on the football team because he's yeah. got three guys and right, probably right. Yeah. five times your size. Did you get coming. along good with the other players? Pretty much. And, and it was a private school, too. So it wasn't yeah. like all these people came from the same place yeah. and went to high school. They didn't so carry private. knives like. No, only guns. <laughs> these <just> guys. <laughs> Do you have, do you, what's your most, do you ever have to say, do you know who my husband is? No. She I, doesn't play that card. I no. don't really say that, no, but I'm very proud of who he no. is and very respectful of all of the years that he's really been such a dedicated um, actor. Mm -hmm. But she was behind the camera, so she knows a lot about mm -hmm. it, so it's not like I'm working with somebody that or married to somebody that doesn't know what I'm doing. Yeah. She knows all the tricks and all the things that have to be done and you can't just all of a sudden say, no, I'm tired and I'm going home. <laughs> and he doesn't have to worry about me embarrassing him, you know, in public. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that I really helped coordinate red carpets mm -hmm. for many years and now I get to walk down it with him. So I feel very grateful. Now you were just received the CW 
Family Film Award, right? Yeah. I'm very, I was yes. very, very proud to be able to do that because there's a lot of people that maybe should have got it instead of me, but I just got lucky and got it. Well, it was actually the iconic yeah. TV show. Now, why is it that his that he's so I, iconic in that? I mean, I mean, People Magazine hasn't named. I mean, the most iconic. I mean, why? Is, what is that? I think that it's. Uh, a show that's been on it started in 1957. It's never been off the air. It plays in about 50 to maybe sometimes 70 different countries all over the world. So it's not just in America. It's all over the world that people see it. In fact, a lot of places in Europe and Asia, that's how they think people live in America because that's all they've ever seen because most of the other shows mm -hmm. are blocked. Yeah. And for some reason, they don't block Leave it to Beaver, so it plays all over the world. I speak something. sometimes, though, very strangely, because a couple of the different countries have little girls dub my oh. voice. <laughs> Japan, yeah. yeah. In yeah. Japan, a little girl yeah. dubs my voice. So not only am I speaking Japanese, but it's definitely not a man's voice <laughs> or a boy's voice. Either. It would be hard to watch it in another language, wouldn't it? You wouldn't know. Well, it's, it's not hard for me, be, but I remember it. I'm thinking, well, that's not what I said. And I go, oh, yeah, that's how you would say it in Japanese. <laughs> now, after, after, after you later were in the, when you graduated, why did you graduate for, for, for philosophy? That's, I just liked it. And it was something. It doesn't that, seem to go. What doesn't it go with? I don't know. Like a. Well, what did you graduate in? I graduate. I didn't graduate. Well, see, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't even know what yeah. philosophy is. Right, right. Philosophy is how people think and how they should live their lives. Ethics? Ethics is one of Ethics, them. Ethics, yeah. There's, there's a whole bunch of them, but I just really liked it. It was something that, you know, I could read. I could read all the different philosophy books and the philosophers from Plato on down. And it was just interesting to see how people, when you, when you study philosophy, and look back at other people, you understand why some of them are, you know, not as happy as others. And it's just, it was just something I really liked. And it was easy for me to write papers about it. And I like doing the, uh, going back and finding other philosophers and seeing what they, each one had their own kind of little twist or turn that they thought is the way that people should live. Yeah, I, I've often thought that when you read a lot of philosophy, it's all pretty well pretty close to the same thing. Yeah, it it's is. Just, it is. Each person had their own, you know, certain way of telling other people what it is and what they thought they should do. Like, like a, you ever read Poor Richard's Almanac? You mm -hmm. know, it's, 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 it's really philosophy. Yeah. But it's just not deep. Nope. And, you know, and, and it just, it's a way of living. You, you find out you know, that certain people lived certain lives, and it's, it's just, it was interesting for me to read about Plato or, you know, all the other philosophers. And Aristotle. Some, Aristotle, and, and some of them are so different than the one yeah, right before them. And yeah. You know, so that, but the good part about that is you can decide which one you think is the right one and go on from there. Like when you get into Norman Vincent Peale and. Oh, yeah, those are the I big mean, boys. those. And, then, and uh, <laughs> Who's that guy? Anthony Robbins, you know. That's yeah. would that be that'd be philosophy too, right? It'd be philosophy, but it's not. You know, it's it's something that when you're reading it, you you know what you're reading. If you read uh, Plato or you know all all the different um, people that you read in the philosophy class, and you start thinking about it, it's how you live your life. What you think you should do? Um, should you do this? Shouldn't you do that? Why shouldn't you do that? Well, because it's not right. You could almost say that philosophy is advice. That's what it is. It's, it's how, just, to, how to live your life. It, advice through experience, uh -huh. maybe. And you have some of the brightest people in the world giving you their experiences and telling you why you should do whatever you... Th this is what they did. You don't have to do it, but this is what they did. And a lot of times it's pretty good. Uh, you know, if you were to be a philosopher today, how would you... How could you add to what's already been saying? Or... But can they? Well, you what you would do is that you now have ways to tell people that wouldn't understand it in the way it was written 20 or 30 or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, maybe for some of it. And it, it's just, it's very interesting to see how people's minds work and how people 
do things? Why do people say this and then do that or say that they will do this and then not do it? Yeah, I don't know. It's do you think do you think philosophy stays pretty well the same? It's for just for it's thousands just, of years. It's just it's just a different way of different people take it and maneuver it maneuver it in different ways. And it's not necessarily the right way when they maneuver it. Um, but you know, Aristotle and Socrates and had certain ways that they believe people should act, and that's what philosophy is. It teaches you how to how to be able to do that. And it seems to me like that most of it, Horace sort of said prior to that, but they sort of twisted it up a little. You know, there's a new guy called David Shermer or something like that. Or Sher he's, a, he's, the, he's the he's the new age philosopher. And they come and go pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, but they don't stay like the others, right? No, no, they're no. Uh, or, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, what do they call it? Creatism, or what's the name of that? Where the mind, they think, some people think the mind's separate from the body. Uh, I've missed that one. I, I keep my mind and body together. <laughs> there, there's one guy that claims the mind and the body are two separate entities. Cre creatism or something like that. Well, mm -hmm. then he can have that, but I like it. My, you my think mind it's the same? Body, I think they're all connected. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure my, my mind and my body are connected. If they're not, <laughs> I'm in big trouble. <laughs> What do you think about how how does your uh, your your kids? What was it like? You have how many kids? Three. Yeah, it they it wasn't hard for them. I mean, you know, I wasn't there, but uh, I'd get up in the morning early because I had to be at the studio at eight, mm -hmm. and I sometimes wouldn't get home till nine or ten o'clock. But I only did that for thirty nine weeks, and then I'd have the rest of the time off till we started the next season. So they got along with it very well, and. And I think they, they liked having a father that they could go to parades and sometimes ride in the cars and do mm -hmm. things like that that other kids absolutely could have never done. So it wasn't yeah. a big thing for them. Yeah. And I, also, it wasn't a big thing for them to see their father on television. And people would say, I saw your father on television last night. And you'd go, so? Yeah. <laughs> so what? He's on television all the time. <laughs> Did you and Tony Dow get along real good? Um, yes, we were always good friends. No problem? No problem, but we were always separated because he was quite a bit older than me. So he had his own teacher. We we had, I went to a school on the lot at Universal, but I had my own teacher who was an elementary school teacher. He had his own. So, but he was a very very nice guy and just had a. He was a, a, a only thing that's bad about him is he's a terrific athlete, and so I wasn't around a lot of other people. And Tony Dow could take five steps over there, jump up in the air do two somersaults and land on his feet. Golly. And I'd say, I can't do that. <laughs> yes, every other kid can do it, because Tony can do it, So, but I yeah. can't. But then I found out that he was an AAU swimming and diving champion, and that's where he got all that stuff. And, the, and he looked like it, too. He looked fit. Well, he, yeah. he had been working as uh, an athlete since he was about five years old. And so he was just a true, I mean, he could do run, do somersaults up in the air, land on his feet. Uh, out swim anybody I know, um, and just a really nice guy that was always looking out for me because he, you know that's what he did. So he was a little bit younger than Eddie Haskell at the time. I yes, guess. maybe just a year or so. I think it was even more than that. I think it was maybe even three or four yeah. years. Yeah, but he was an interesting guy too. He's just a, a you know everybody says oh how he was such a terrible person. He was the nicest guy and he was a cop. He was a motorcycle cop. So how'd you like to be driving too fast on the freeway? The lights go on. All of a sudden, walks up to your window and goes, "Roll it down," and it'd be Eddie Haskell. <laughs> that would really, that would you'd think he's in a dream, wouldn't you? Yeah, he'd take off that big white hat and yeah. go, "You were speeding." Now, the days when you were in, you were in the banking business. I was a banker as an operations officer. Did you like that, or was it? It was. It was good. It, I needed something. I was between um, uh, high school and college, and I just wanted oh. to go out and basically find out a job and a, uh, the bank I had basically honestly put a lot of money into. It's one of the biggest banks. I won't tell you which one, but it was a big bank. And the guy said, what are you going to do now? You graduated from high school. And I said, well, I'm going to go to college, but I don't know when. And he said, how would you like to work at the bank? So I spent about uh, a year and a half in a, a commercial bank. And I was ended up as a loan officer. So I was making loans of like, you know, basically thousands of dollars to buy houses. And then I went back to school and graduated from Berkeley. I have a degree in philosophy. 
And then I started working on different projects and all sorts of things. You had a real interesting life. Yep, it's been good. I mean, everything so far, and I'm sure hopefully it will go on, but, uh, you know, people have always been nice. Everybody likes Leave it to Beaver, and, um, you know, it's something I'm very proud to have done, and people all over the world. It's not only in this country, but it plays in, I think it's like 26 languages all over the world. Um, it's funny, sometimes when I'm in an airport, somebody will come up to me and start talking to me in a, in a foreign language because they don't realize that <laughs> I don't speak whatever, their, la weird, I don't that speak whatever yeah. their language is. <laughs> and that, what, they probably don't understand that you don't. That's what, yeah, they say, well, I, you know, and then somebody else, maybe a friend of theirs or somebody say, from, say will say, yeah, they don't realize that you don't speak their language because they watch you every day and you're, <laughs> you know, it looks like they're speaking it. No. Wouldn't that would really, that they could think you were rude. I think they do because, you yeah. know, all I can do is kind of say, hi, yeah, yeah. hello, hello, yes, um, yeah. Uh, uh, and a lot of times they'll go like this and that means they want an autograph and that makes it yeah. a lot easier. Do you, do, you, do you get excited now about the future? Um, no. Because I don't know what the future is going to be. I'm excited about what it could be, but I know that you know I don't want to set my self something that is going to disappoint me in in the future. So I I know I've got a good life. Everything's going good. Um, there are things I want to do, and I hope I can do them. But if I can't, it's not going to ruin my life. You think God's in charge of all of this? No. Because I think I'm in charge, and He's watching over me. That's a different take, isn't it? Or it's For a, me, it is. I mean, you know, I know people that are not very happy, and I find out, you know, that they just don't know, you know, what's going on in their life. I know what's going on in my life. I know I was born. I know I'm going to die. And in between, I'm going to do what I think I should do. Well, boy, you have had one one heck of a of a career. Now, now on... Still the beaver. Mm -hmm. Was that, how did you get that? Because that had, is, was that a new, somebody's idea or your idea? Or? Well, they, they came to us and they knew that Leave it to Beaver as a show, the old Leave it to Beaver, was so popular that they wanted something else. The fans were always saying, well, there's only, we did it for six years. So why, why did it stop in six years? Because that's uh, under the, the Screen Actors Guild, which all actors have to be in. Mm. That's the longest they can sign you up for a, a show. Mm. And then they have to start you again. Oh. So, um, well, that complicates it, doesn't it? Yeah, but it was fun. I mean, the, the funnest part was when we went back years later when I was in my 20s and did the new Leave it to Beaver. The, the movie or the... Or the... the the episode after that we did yeah. um you know and it was fun because a lot of people we got the same crew back which is that's when you impossible. were divorced it, right i was divorced and, and, right, and raising my family and but we got a lot of the original people back but we also got the crew of probably 115 people the, a lot of the same guys the cameramen all it was it was just like like you walked into a place and walked back you know 10 years 15 years later and everybody was the same they were all a lot older but we were too now, you were how old then, roughly? For what? It, for Still the Beaver. Still the Beaver, I was about uh, 16, 18, around in there. So the, the years we oh. did it. So, there's a, so you were still young then. Mm -hmm. I always hate that they had you divorced in that. That was, that to me... It, it, well, they, they, they knew that everything was going so, fi so smoothly on Leave it to Beaver. And a lot of people had written them saying, you know, this is not the way things really are in the real world. A lot of people are divorced. And so they had Wally get divorced, but they always, you know, said that, well, maybe Beaver should be divorced to show those people. Because he, a lot divorced of, Mel, he married Mel, Mary, Mary Ellen, Ellen Rogers, yeah. his girlfriend from yeah. high school. So, but the Beaver was more of the person that, that should be. So people that, because there were a lot of people, as you said, that were divorced and they wanted to show that, that wasn't the worst thing that could happen to a kid. They wanted it. They wanted to know that it's not the worst thing. It's right? not the worst thing that you. It, if it could happen to the beaver, it he, could happen. He, he, and because the way he was raised yeah. and his parents, then it could happen. And it to happened anybody. anyway. There's, there's sometimes there's nothing you can do. No, nope. you, you made you made a bad choice, or somebody made a bad choice, and you or just people got, change, or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Somewhere that would fit in philosophy too, wouldn't it? Yep. <laughs> now, 
There were, my understanding is that there were some episodes that were actually lost. They, I've heard that, but I have never seen any. But it, the thing is, uh, there are so many episodes. We did 39 a year for six years. So it, it really depends because I've never stood around and watched on TV you know, the 39 episodes for six years. <laughs> but but were the episodes shot, was it like they were shot like this? Or was it or was it mixed up between, you know, I'll have y'all come in here. I mean, was it shot, or movie, or sitcoms like that shot chronological? No. Leave it to Beaver was shot on a film um, like a movie. So we had all movie lights and cameras so it wasn't like a live show where they go around and they just do it in one day mm -hmm. so like if if we three were here they'd shoot a long shot and they'd come in and shoot a close-up on you close up on her and then two shots maybe if one person was talking a lot more than the others mm -hmm. so it was and we did it in uh, a week we had monday we'd come in or friday we'd get the new script over the weekend we were supposed to just read it and a Monday morning, we'd come in and we'd go to a, the producer's offices. And, and most of the people, if they had a, more than probably 10 or 15 lines, would be there. If they had less than that, they wouldn't. And one of the secretaries would read their part. The next day, we'd go onto the set and block it. And the next three days, we'd shoot it and then start all over again the next Monday. So, so the editing was where it was all put together into a show, I guess, right? Well... Yes and no. I mean, yes, it was put together, but they knew what they were doing. I mean, they knew before they started it what was going to be where. Right. And it was just a matter of saying, okay, yeah, I'm out. You know, like if, if we were here, they might want a close up on you, close up on her. But then again, they may want a two shot with you hmm. or a two shot with us because that was something that was really important that we were saying. See, when I, when, when I think about it, being not, not into that business, I see it as is it's shot like this and that's not the way it is at all it's put into pieces because right. somebody is saying we're going to need that shot later well you, you yeah you just like they, they would shoot everything that was in the boys room even if it was the first scene of the show the middle scene of the show yeah and the last scene of the show they would all be shot one right after the other so you weren't you you couldn't really think about it in the sequence of events no it was just what you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And then it, they would, it was kind of not sad, but we would, the kids could only work a certain amount of time. We could work from eight till five or nine till six. And so they would do all our shots, our two shots, our close ups. And but then the, uh, the adult actors would have to come back if they were in that scene and do theirs after we left, which is either five or six o'clock, depending if we came in at eight in the morning or nine in the morning. So we'd go home and the crew would be there. Sometimes till you know, eight or nine at night, at Universal at, at Universal Studios on the lot. So they, you know, they might have a thing in the living room, or they'd have something in the mm -hmm. ward's office or the kitchen. So, and those are all just sets. I mean, they they look like a real house, but all those walls just break down. So if if we were shooting you, there'd be a cam I'd be the camera and we'd shoot you, and then if they shot me, they'd put the wall back and come this way. Oh, that's. That would that would take away my thinking of it if I saw all well, that. Well, that's why we usually don't tell yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't see. You always notice that when they're when she's washing dishes, you know, there's at sometimes there's not a wall there. You're you're thinking they're looking out the window, but there's not. Uh -uh. Remember on McHale's Navy, they just you ever watch McHale's Navy? Very. They would stand behind that behind that cabinet like they were in a ship. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that was made on the Universal lot, so I knew, not didn't know him well, but I knew all those people on the show. That was a. It wasn't that funny, but it was really good. Yeah, it was it, a good it, show. It, it was just it had its own thing, mm -hmm. and a lot of good actors. That's could particular. could would you be out there sometimes and see Gilligan's Island walking by or something? Not Gilligan's Island because that was made, I think, at Dizzy Lou, and we were Universal, but we saw you know we saw a lot of people and. Uh, Universal did a lot of movies too, so there were a lot of people that you wouldn't see on mm. TV that you'd only see in the theater, and there they were sitting next to you at lunch. Who is the driving force behind all this? Is it the actors? Is it the producers? It's, it's the producers. They 
they had an idea, um, you know, in the early 50s. And, uh, but I mean behind any of them. Well, what do you mean by any I of mean them? like any of these shows that are success. Well, the, the producer comes in, and they, they, we were Joe Conley and Bob Mosier. They had been Amos and Andes on uh, radio. Uh, where they wrote all the Amos and Andes, and mm -hmm. then they wanted to go in the film business. And they had, uh, I think it was 12 or 15 kids between them. So they decided to do a, a kid show because they figured they'd have a lot of things they could pick up from their own kids. Mm -hmm. And we, I went on the interview. The interview for The Beaver had about 800 kids for three different days because um, they just said they wanted a young, a young boy that was an all-American boy. And so I went on it. I went on the interview four times. And every time you'd see some of the people that you'd seen before, but there were a couple of new people there. And then they called me back for the last one and said, you're going to be on a, I mean, we're going to make, do a, uh, a shoot and you're going to be the beaver. And I said, well, okay. It didn't mean much to me. <laughs> it's just, you know. How were you, how were you? Six? Eight? I'm six. I think I was seven. I was just turning seven. Did your mother take you there mm -hmm. to, to. Yeah. They, you have to have a. a they she have a wanted welfare, you to be on it? Well, you have, a, I have to have a welfare worker who is from the city of LA to make sure that you can't work so many hours at. Uh, if, if you're a child actor and you're working and it's, you come in at eight, you leave at five. And if you're in the middle of a scene that they may have been trying to get for an hour at five o'clock, she'll walk on and say, come on, Jerry, we're leaving. Because that's, that's it. Oh, isn't that so? Yeah, it's, it's a good business. I mean, they take very, very, very good care of the kids. Now, a lot of child actors end up with issues, don't well, they? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to be a, a child actor and suddenly, especially if you haven't had a lot in your life, have a lot of money and suddenly you know, the show's over and you have all this money and you may not be living with your parents anymore. I got very lucky. Uh, my dad was a vice principal and principal of uh, uh, high, school. high school. And so um, he knew what kids should do and what they shouldn't. and I. Did some things in my life that I, you know, he would take me in and talk to me and do other things. <laughs> but, you know, I, I had a very, very good life. And a lot of the poor people that were on other shows, not so much Leave to Beaver, and their parents went out and spent all the money they had, and they turned, you know, 21 when you're supposed to get your money, and the parents said, well, it's gone. Mine didn't do that. I took my money and went to college with it. Jerry also had a very solid home life. He did chores, he, yep. you know, he, he, you were with your yep. brothers and sisters, so that really helped also yes. kind of keep him on the so, straight and Somebody narrow. was behind keeping him. Uh, right. Well, my dad was good at, so he was a, a, a superintendent, a but a, a vice principal at that time. So he was dealing with the best of kids and the worst of kids. <clears throat> right. He knew if you did something that it was just, oh, that's typical, but, or if you were getting a little more over the line, he put you back on the track. Now, wasn't your your mother? She was a uh, she was involved in the uh, something with keeping the uh, welfare of of children. Yes. What? The, what how do you? Um, the motion was, picture. It's called the motion picture mother. Mothers, yeah, motion so, picture mother. And she was one <clears throat> of the. Um, she was president for a couple times and did had other uh, whatever they have in that organization. But it's for all the people because. You know, when, when you're a kid, you don't really have much say. And they wanted the mothers to know um, what could be done and what shouldn't be done. Because, you know, at a studio, when they have that much money on the line and it's, say, 6 o'clock and the kid's supposed to leave at 6 o'clock, and they go, oh, well, it just, it'll only take another minute. Yeah. It doesn't take another minute. It's so, 15 or 20 yeah, or 30. Or a lot, so, yeah. Sometimes more than that. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just, you know, it was, it was a good life for me. I had uh, no problems. I had... The best thing was you had a private teacher and they could pick the best teachers from the LA Unified School District for your grade level. And that was your teacher for the year, just you. So it was something that was, you know, the best education you could possibly get. You actually ended up with probably a better education. Oh, absolutely. Because you're on one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. with a really well-groomed teacher for your grade. On the Courthouse Square at 30 2nd Street is the law firm of Logan Thompson Law. 
Since 1965, they have served the legal needs for the good citizens of Cleveland Bradley County. If you've got a problem, they're no problem. Give them a call. Well, that was a really good thing, wasn't it? Because if not, you could end it up like some of these others we won't mention. They had really problems had they been a well, child actor. You know, a lot of them had parents that the reason that they were there was so that they could get money so that they could, mm -hmm. you know, spend it. Where my dad was um, fully employed, he worked for the LA Unified School Districts, but, uh, you know, they, that my parents weren't living off the money I was making on Leave it to Beaver. But a lot of those parents, a lot of the other parents, not all of them, I'm not saying they were all bad, but there was a few that, you know, the kids turned uh, 18 or 21 when we were supposed to get all the money that had been saved up, mm. and they got zip. Well, for somebody to start a TV show or series or movies, it would just be almost impossible to start from scratch, wouldn't it? What do you mean by scratch, though? Like, uh, like not even being in the business or anything. Uh, I mean, you'd have to be... I, I, you, you could if you had, you know, a little training. I mean, it's 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 not that tough. It's not. But how would you get anybody to even buy it or put it on or well, put that, it that, out? Well, that's a different story. That's who. That's where you go to your people that are at your a advertising agency, and the advertising agency takes the show and takes it to certain sponsors who are, you know, whatever they are, and they say this is a really good kids show, and adults will watch it because their kids are going to watch it, and you should, you know, invest your money here. To do this show, so they would they would actually have to sell the idea of the show of to, the show to the people that they were going to be doing the commercials. We had Remington Rand and a couple of other uh, you know, the big, really big companies, not just little mom and pop stores. These were the the big boys playing in the game, and you know we were. That's why we always are. Wally always types all his, <laughs> his things because it was Remington Rand. Yeah, yeah, it was our sponsor. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Did they, they, did they ever say that that was a Remington Rand? No, but they always ride? shot it so you would yeah. see on the top yeah. of it, right above yeah. the keyboard, it says Remington Rand on it. And, and there was always <laughs> one on the boys' desk. There was always a always, Remington. Always, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, a lot of people, I did when I was in uh, high school and in college, I did everything on a typewriter. So it wasn't like it was something mm -hmm. that wouldn't be no. that was the, That was your computer today. I mean, it didn't yeah. do all that, but that was the equivalent. I mean, yeah. It's expensive and... Hard to expensive. get and had to have one. And you had to have one. And if you didn't, your teacher would say, well, go out and go to the library and type it on their type, library. Yeah. And you waited for an hour while mm -hmm. a guy in front of you typed it, uh, his, and then you got to type yours. And now they can email it. Mm -hmm. I can email you and you can be here in two days or back there in two days. And it's Whole just, un it's hard to believe. You think what it'll be in, you know, two years, three years, 10 years. We have to think that it's got to be something. I mean, you go back to 1999. Did we have the flip phone then? When did the phones, the cell phones come out? Like a, I, I don't really know because like, I've had them, but I, I just. It was like, like maybe a brick, you know, the brick. Yeah. You know, I, I, they just come and they go, and then they get better, and then you don't want that one anymore, and you yeah. move on to the next one. So it's hard you to say. You use a smartphone? When... Yes. Well, well, I don't know. It's not very smart. But... <laughs> <laughs> but you're modern. You keep up with, I guess you have to, don't you? Because you can't even buy the flip phones no more. No. Right? Well... <laughs> when you garden, what do you like to garden? Well, my wife is in the Rose Society. Rose? Rose. Rose. So she does roses and... Um, Shows them. Is that what this is called? Showing them? Exhibition. Uh, exhibition. That's the and word I, I was do looking. photography of roses, which photography I love. Photography of yes, roses. I love it a lot. Do you, do, so you set up what they call stills? Steel shots? Um, uh, actually, most of it is with the iPhone because the quality is so amazing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that works perfect. What do you get? How many? I guess it's. You can take a lot of different pictures of roses, angles and stuff. Yes. And we have a lot of roses to take pictures of, let me tell you. <laughs> like like four or five different species? Oh, a lot more. Yeah. A lot more. And I submit my, my photos to the American Rose Society calendar. And so every year I usually get one of them at least in there. You mean in the 12 
I guess. Well, it's they have twelve of the full pages, mm -hmm. and all together, and there's some smaller ones. So they there's sixty one photos that they accept, mm -hmm. and it's been about five hundred to six hundred entries every year. So I feel really honored that a lot of the times they'll pick one of mine to be in there. Why roses, not tulips or jonquils? Um, you know, it just started going to Rose Society meetings in the, yeah, yeah. Well, in the where we live, city where we live. She looked it up and all of a sudden she said, what is this? It says that they're having a Rose meeting. Yeah. And I went, I don't know. It's something they have. I've seen yeah. that. It's always been there. So she went to the thing. And the next thing she was the president of this and the vice president <laughs> of that. I was going, okay. <laughs> Yeah, and he helps it a lot too, and you know. It's it's good to stay busy, right? It is good to, and be outside. You know, it's it's good. It's really we enjoy it together too, which is nice. What other hobbies do you have? Um, that's a big one. That takes up a that. lot of a lot of time yeah. because you gotta you're digging them up, you're digging this out, pruning, you're trimming you look, that back. What about the what about when you uh, you know you prune? No, when you like make a different. Oh, um, Rudy. Kind of, Rooting. Yeah, yeah, we do that too. Yeah. Can you get can you get some really neat colors? Beautiful colors. There's so many species of roses. I've wondered why you haven't seen any green roses. There is a green rose. A green rose. There is a green rose. Absolutely. How do they get that? Some, Spray paint. No. <laughs> somewhere <laughs> along the way, somebody uh, hybridized the green rose and I well, have to well, how, how would they so they hybrid them with different things to get yeah, the green they, they put different um, you know they have a way to put the different seedlings together and um, there's just thousands of different names and actually I was very um, anxious to have the Jerry Mathers rose uh -huh. and, so I have my own rose. and we do have that now we had a hybridizer that put that together for us now, wouldn't it be something, you can't get her roses for Christmas or Valentine's, right? Because she's already got them. She's got a whole backyard full and front yard. <laughs> well, Christmas time, they're not doing so yeah, great in the winter. Yeah, there's not much to but... get rid of Christmas time. But... Me and my wife, we don't get, we just give up on getting each other stuff. It's too complicated. Yeah, it's always the wrong size, too big, too little. Too big, too many, too, right. too few. We just pick out something we both like and make yeah. it easy. How, did you any of your kids get into acting? They um, did community theaters. Um, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, um, my brothers are cameramen. Um, but uh, yeah, the kids. Well, um, your son is also a sound person. Yeah, a sound person. So, so they're more the behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, yeah. Why did June always wear high heels? So she'd be taller than us and taller. And they were growing. So yeah. she had to. At, at first, we were way below her, and suddenly we both shut. Tony and I both shot up, and we, you know they were people were saying, "Wait a minute, how can they? They're the same size she is." So then they started getting her a little high, a little higher, a little higher, and pretty soon she was wearing really high heels. But she was a New York model, so it was something that that was been, what she was originally, yeah, right? Yeah. So she was used to wearing high heels. It wasn't like it was some big, uh, big thing for her to do it. Was she? How about how tall was she? Probably be five, 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 six, around in there. Because she looked tall in TV. Well, she had those high she heels. Was thin. Yeah. She was thin. She was thin yeah. and really high yeah. heels. And uh, But she always wore pearls, right? Right, because I don't know why, but she had uh -huh. the hollow in your neck right here. Uh -huh. And she thought when she was on the screen, because of the way they had the lighter, if they put too much light on her this way, it made her eyes look funny. That she wanted to have something that would go over that part of her neck that would so they could just use it for regular uh, regular lighting on her. Well, there's a reason for all that stuff, isn't there? Yeah, anything that looks odd or peculiar, there's probably a reason why they're doing it that way. What about even the pictures on the wall? Is everything specific? Yeah, I mean, there were all things that they, you know, wanted to have there. Um, so they'd go to the... the photo department and find, we, we when we came in every year, um, we came in like four days early, we started rehearsing the new series, but we also did a lot of stuff to change things in the house or do other things like that. Do you, what would you, here's one thing that I've always wanted, I, I'm a big uh, 
sitcom, I guess. I don't know if you call it a sitcom. I guess it was a sitcom, right? Mm -hmm. Just a, I call it a series or whatever. Yeah. But Hugh Beaumont always said, always said, break your bread or break your toast. Well, yeah. Why was that? I, just, I have no idea. But the interesting part about him is what he really was, was a Methodist minister. So it was, um, and Leave it to Beaver was not why. Before that, he had been in a place where they couldn't afford a minister. And so he had gone to acting to be able to pay for opening up this church that he had. And so when he was doing Leave it to Beaver, he still worked there, mm. but at least it was ongoing then. So just a really nice man. And, you know, he's a Methodist minister. But why did he always say breakers? That was always odd to me, but he got on to him several times, and I don't know if that was written into the script or if that was... Yeah. Was he to, able to ad-lib any, or was it all pretty well written? Well, you could ad-lib, but if you did ad-lib something, they had a, a director right there, and a lot of times even the writers were there, and they would, if they didn't want it, they would just say, Cut, don't say that again, we want it to be said this way. Other times they might say, nah, I don't, we don't care about that. That's all right. So if they didn't want it said that way, you didn't say it that way. You didn't say it that way. And, and they would, if it wasn't, they would just cut it out. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes Jerry would say something just as being a kid. Yeah. And then, oh, we like that. Yeah. We like, we, yeah. We like it, that better. That's the, way it, yeah. that's the way a kid would talk. So they didn't have cue cards for you. No. Now. You went in, you, had, you got a script on um, Friday night. A driver would drop it off at your house. And so you had the weekend to kind of learn your lines. Monday, we'd go in and read it. Tuesday, we'd block it on the set. So that was you'd walk and you could read your lines, but they'd rather that you'd known them by then. But if you had one that was a hard one or maybe for some reason you didn't, and then the next three days we'd shoot and that was eight to five. The poor adults had to stay until it was over. They'd sometimes be there till nine or 10 at night because they'd have to go from one set to another set. And that took maybe sometimes... 30, 45 minutes to go to the next set and get all the lights set. Plus, they had to say, we got to shoot y'all's later because we got to get theirs done because yeah, it's almost 6 o'clock. Yeah, the kids, and, and sometimes that was really, you know, not the best thing to do because they could have just done it right away, but the next set was way over here, and then they had to come all the way back. But that's the way the game goes. Was there ever a time when they didn't care that much about the child actor and they didn't set times? Was that... I, not that I know of. That may have been before I it was. Had, it had to have been done wrong before they changed it yeah, to rhyme. I imagine like, you know, yeah. our gang comedy and things like that yeah. that were made in the 30s and 40s. I bet that was it. Yeah. But when we came in in 1957, it was pretty much all sewed up. This is the way you do it. You had a, a teacher, and she was also your welfare worker. Mm -hmm. So she was in charge, and she made sure that we could be in the middle of a scene and on a Friday night and... You know, it just wasn't going right. And all of a sudden, she'd walk onto the set when the cameras were rolling and say, stop, time for the kids to go home, and we'd leave. Hmm. Because they can only work you from 8 to 5 or 9 to 6. Do you ever see, uh, now that your friends were, well, it was first Whitey. Whitey was and, one of them. And then Larry. And Larry. Then Gilbert. Mm -hmm. Then Richard. Was mm -hmm. that about it? Yep. Now, later on, when you did... Uh, the new leave to the Beaver. leave it to Beaver was that the same you when you came back to town? Well, we we found as many as we could. Well, was the Richard? Yeah, Richard is, was the same Richard, mm -hmm. and yeah. he was kind of interesting because the writers of Leave It to Beaver were Conley and Mosier, mm -hmm. but before that they had written uh, for radio and television, Amos and Andy, mm -hmm. and that's who they were. Was Richards. Am Richard's father was Amos and Amos and Andy, but the voice of it. Oh, so and that was Richard's father. Yeah, and and the same Richard that was on our show on right. our on when and he, he and as they say he had been working with the writers. So Richard was the same one, and and still the Beaver that was the voice on Amos and Andy. Well, his his father was his father was the voice on Amos and, and Andy. And the writers of Leave It to Beaver were also the writers of Amos and Andy on radio and on television. I see, and then moved on to Leave It to Beaver. But it was the same Richard. The same. Well, he had kind of a lisp, didn't he, in the first season? No, he didn't have a lisp. He, no. was, he was the one with the big haircut because that was his big thing. And right. It was always a, his, his mom and dad hated it, and they always said, like, "You went to the barber shop." And he's going, ah, nah, nah, nah. 
but uh, and they've been lifelong friends. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. You mean? Yeah. Now, yeah, now, I read on the internet where Larry worked at a Home Depot in Kentucky. Was that the real one? Or and I have no. I've read that too, but I don't know because I, it wasn't in Kentucky. I mean, all yeah. of a sudden, his parents. He did, and I can't remember. There was a movie that he did, and his parents decided that they wanted him to just do movies from then on. And then they moved out of Los Angeles, mm. and I never saw him again. Is that right? He may be alive, may not. We don't yeah, know. No, don't know. How about Gilbert? He's um, a actually a, a very prominent uh, producer yeah. for public television. Yeah. yeah. And um, he's still doing that. Yeah, he's, I think he's he is. I mean, very, very good. What about Whitey? Whitey passed. Yeah, I think he he had a uh, drug problem and passed away. Boy, it's really been it's really interesting to watch those shows and to know what happened to the people Did, what what would you say is the most uh is there any time that you were recognized that stands out to you that was the most no i mean people do that to me all the time so it's I mean, it's something i'm very used to um you know people come up to me and say aren't you jerry mathers yeah, yeah. oh i love the show da 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 and i talk to them for a minute and move on now, now weren't you and wally back didn't y'all or uh, Tony, didn't y'all go into uh, do some plays also? Yeah, we did a lot of dinner theaters. Um, a lot of times, the last year of the show, because we would shoot for um, six months and seven months sometimes, and then we'd take uh, time off, and Tony and I would go out and do dinner theater. So it was fun. You went into these, you know, these towns all over the, mm -hmm. the Midwest, mm -hmm. and we'd spend maybe five weeks, six weeks at them, and then we'd move on to the next one, and um, we were doing plays, so it was easy. We were doing the same play mm -hmm. in each one of the towns. Mm -hmm. you meet a lot of nice people. You'd go out to dinner with them after the show, and, and it was just fun. Well, it's been a wonderful life, hasn't it? Mine has, yep. And I found a nice wife, so how can you can't beat it? You can't beat it. What, what else do you got going on? Um, you know, we travel around the country doing autograph shows, and we also have a merchandise site, uh -huh. which uh, we have T-shirts and hats. And do you do you monitor the site I like do. on Twitter? I do. Well, um, I actually am. I actually work with another partner with us. Uh, Jerry does personal autographs on the photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, right, I got one right, here, right, right there. Yeah, and we. Um, so we have that. It's actually jerrymathersbeavermerch.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. On the internet. Uh, on the internet. Yeah. And so that's really fun. And I also manage uh, his social media. Right now there are 229,000 people on his Facebook page, which is The Jerry Mathers. And it is astounding because yeah. they just are just so gracious and there's so many interesting things that they write and a so, lot of questions why did you do this questions. well that's what it yeah. said in the script <laughs> do you remember every episode or is it no. like me being in first grade i don't remember uh i don't remember them but when i see them i can tell you pretty quickly what's going to happen in them but i don't really just you know i don't i couldn't give you every if you said well start on one and go for the whole seven eight years I couldn't tell you what every show was about. And each show had also in it a sub sub things that went on. And sometimes it's hard for me to yeah. see which one is the most important. And you might have shot it this week and it went with the next week. So. Yeah, if, if we happen to be there. Do you think that if you hadn't become an actor, what would you have done? No idea. Because <coughs> I started acting at two. So it wasn't like I was bound on a certain trail and then got guided off. Uh, my mom took me to a store it was called Desmond's at the time when I was two years old and she was buying me things for my birthday, uh, an outfit for my birthday. And this lady came up to her and she said, is that your little boy? And she said, oh, I'm sorry. If he broke something, I'll fix it, whatever. And the lady said, no, but I've noticed you've been trying on a lot of our clothes and he seems to fit them all and I'm the head of what what promotions here. We have a fashion show every like Monday or Thursday or something. Could he be the little boy for our fashion show? And my mom went, uh, I don't know, because she thought this was a big city. Yeah. And they said, well, if he did, we'd pay him $10 and he could keep whatever outfit he wore. Mom said, he could do that. <laughs> so that's how I started. And that was when- She discovered you. Well, she didn't really discover me because then I went into 
live TV and they were looking around. Now in New York, they could go to the New York stage to find kids. And here in Hollywood, there weren't that many that were actors. That, and so they just said, well, wait a minute, those guys that do that, they could maybe do this. And, yeah. and we did, and it was easy. You know, They'd say, see that nice lady there? You're gonna walk up, hold her hand, and she's gonna walk away with you. I can do that. You know. And he did it, and he didn't cry, and he didn't put yeah. up a fuss, and so they knew that they could trust that he could do other and things. There was a lot as of money well. involved. I mean, they get a kid that walked in there and started crying. <laughs> right. Yeah, they may have to work four yeah. or five hours to get another child over there, reshoot things that that child may have done. So you, know, you I, could save, you could make it efficient for them. Yeah, I, I, right. I it didn't bother me. Yeah. I was so used to doing it, I didn't realize that. Everybody didn't do that. <coughs> what do you think is the, uh, is there any reason that you know that you're so charismatic? Because that's what you are. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, we had very good writers. Conley and Mosier, who were the writers. Of I don't Eva believe that's Eva. it. I believe there's something else there. I you know, know, I think one thing is that a lot of people could relate to his character as the beaver. And um, a lot of people tell us, well, I was Wally in my family, and my brother was the beaver, and it was so connective. And I think for that reason, people really relate to him. And it has been 65 years. Yeah, it's been 65 years, and it's never been off the air. And we say, is there any show right now that you can think of that you're going to see 65 years from now? Well, my, I guess Andy Griffith, but that actually came along a little later, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was so thinking, if some, right now. Oh. 65 years from now, no, it's right? So, it just, they just don't have the talent that they had back then. I don't know about that, but stories, it, thank you very much. But it was, you know, it was so easy. I, it was just, I, you know, I'd study my lines. I'd been working as an actor since I started on live TV. So when I was doing like Leave it to Beaver and all those shows, they were easy because they were filmed. Live TV, you had to know every line and you couldn't miss it or the whole, mm. everybody was thrown off. Who's your favorite philosopher? You had to read it. Probably Plato. It's you know it's just I just liked it because it was something that uh, interested me. I mean I could I could see it I could read it and then I'd say oh yeah that's probably right this oh, oh that's why. see back then there were Socrates Plato and Aristotle mm -hmm. right yep and there still is <laughs> yeah they're, they're still there but now they say Plato got his stuff from Arist from yeah, Socrates they, who right knows? who knows that's you know they they were very all very very smart men and you know it's just I like to read about them. I like to look up at the stars and see what they saw. And it's it's just something that uh, people say. Well, why did you want to do that? Well, it was just very interesting for me to see all the things that they thought about. Well, I'm very interesting in 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 philosophy too. And I I've, I've read all those guys and and uh, even Dale Carnegie. To me, his mm -hmm. philosophy was. And people are always coming he, up with it. He summed it all up pretty good. Yep. And the Bible does a lot of that, too. It's just not in our language, I guess. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand it. That's the thing. They read it, but they don't really right. understand what they're reading. They say, well, that says this. Well, it says this, but what it really means is something a little bit different. Now, isn't it funny that some people will have an experience or see something? Me and you will look at something, all three of us. And we'll all have just a little bit different interpretation. Well, that's what makes it so interesting, is that each person has a different view of the world and because of what they've been brought up as and what the things they've done in their lives. So some people see one thing and some people see another. And probably both of them are right for what they see because <clears throat> that's what they believe. So, so, what, so if we see something, you think we're really... not tarnished, but our biases are letting us see it one way because of our experiences and our biases? Yeah, because that's, that's the things that we know that we have got in, in our heart that, that we see the world that way. That's the only way we can relate it. Well, the only way, because that's somehow in our, in our short lifetime, we've seen that and that's the way we think it should go. But there's a person over here that has seen the same thing and says it's got to go the other direction. So it's, you know, it's, it's just interesting that people, and that's what makes us all different. There's very few people, I don't think there's any that are exactly the same. It, I guess that goes with that saying, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yep. Very much so. 
So if I'm if I'm raised in the mountains and I see something, I'm going to see it this way or, well, if you're or, the, or experiences. Well, if you're the first child, you're going to see everything one way. And if you're the second child, or the second child, you're going to see it. But if you're the 10th or 9th, you know, 8th or ninth child, it's going to be a lot different world. But you've got a lot of people to teach you what to do and show you the right ways to go, hopefully. You know, I've, I've noticed that some people that are born in, in families that work a lot, their kids will work a lot. Yeah. And if you're born in a family that views success as not having to work, then they view success as not working as being success. So there's no way you can hardly get that out of your head However, you're it depends. You're yeah. raised, right? Yeah, yeah. Your 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 parents look at you and show you, and you think that's the way to live. And if they are certain parents, they teach you one thing. If they're other parents, they teach you another. And it's hard to get that. It's almost impossible, really. I'm not even sure if it is possible. And I'm I always wonder too, if if maybe that's the way it is because that's the way we see. Does that make sense? I, I mean, think, yeah, if you see something some way and it works for you, then it's what it, what it is to you. But to me, it may be something that doesn't work for me and you can't understand why, but I just don't need that in my, my wheelhouse. And, and we can, and both our thoughts, we can still go along with these two separate thoughts. But when do they intermingle? I've always gotten that because then we because yeah. then we get into. Uh, you ever hear somebody say, "Oh, I'm a realist," yeah. and I'm thinking, "Eh." But what's real? That's, what's real? That's the whole problem because a lot and, of it and, isn't. And they're going to say, "Oh, I know what's real," but I'm I'm saying that the way we look at it can really change. So when somebody says, I'm a realist, I don't think there's such a thing. Well, I don't think anybody can be a realist because you really can't see what's real. There are a lot of things that you think are real That's right. that aren't real. If you could see everything and it was real, that would be a different story, but it's not. Because we're almost, because we're somewhat hypnotized by our we have everything. Our own biases. Yes, we have and, everything, and we know this, and we know that. And sometimes you find out after years and years that what you thought was absolutely true is not. It's different. And it may have changed. It may have been true when you were younger, but somebody did something, flipped this, flipped that, and the next thing you know, it's not what you thought it was. But, but it's hard for people to communicate when they're looking at it at two completely different perspectives. Well, different people see different things. It depends what they feel is the thing that they're supposed to see. When you look at something, you have, even before, even if you just glance at it, you have an idea of what you think it is, mm -hmm. but sometimes it's not that at all. It's, you know, it's, it's something different. I've always thought of it like this. If you, if you broke a window and I said, hey, Jerry, look at this window. It's, as, it's the shape of a horse's head. You'd see a horse's head. Now, every time you looked at that cracked window for the rest of your life, you'd see that horse's head. No, you better it, fix it. If you fixed it, I wouldn't. <laughs> but if I didn't fix it, you would always see the horse's head, right? Well, you better. I'd say you fix it, though. I think that'd be a much better idea. But you see what I'm saying. I see what Once you see yes. it one way, it's hard to change it in your mind. Uh, not my mind. I change things all the time because I know that I'm, I'm not infallible. But then we get back into what's what's real, right? It's real if you can see it and touch it and really know it's there. And there are other things that aren't real. Cartoons aren't real. They're there, you can touch them, but they're not real. They're not real people. So there is such a thing as realism. Yes. But it's hard to find. <laughs> Especially stuff, stuff that you can't touch or feel, right? Yeah, especially for things you only know yeah. about. You've heard about them. They're really there. You may believe them. It may be religious. It may be for other reasons. Right. But there are a lot of things that are there that people will tell you, yes, it's really there. I really believe that. And if they do, they do. And I'm not going to tell them that it's because I don't understand what they're doing. It's not there. But now, but now we're talking into 
to somebody's opinion or the way they yeah but they're allowed that they're allowed to have their own opinion of whatever it is as long as it doesn't interfere with what i think of all right but 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 i'm talking about the stuff that we can touch or feel yeah i guess they we when somebody says i'm a i'm a realist i know what there's this table is real i, I know it's real mm-hmm but we could say it's hot outside, it's cold outside. That's the difference. In, well, it might not be hot or it might be not about, be that, That's a matter of perspective. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Perspective can change the way I view stuff. And so, well, what, if you stand up, this table is going to look different than when we're here sitting down. That's right. The table is still here. It's still here, but it's going to look different. You'll mm-hmm. see the legs. You'll see it right now. You really only see the top. When you stand up, you'll see the legs. You'll see this. You'll see that. You'll see... The length it has, the width it has. When you just sit here, you just pretty much see what's in front of you. So the perspectives change, but the table never does. No, the table is real. The perspective is different looking at that particular object. But now if I'm going through something that uh, diff- has a different, a different I don't know what I'm saying, perspective for me mm-hmm. that we both can live in mm-hmm. is is religion is, a, is an example. Somebody could have this religion, somebody could have that religion. You're not going to prove either one of them, but we can both live with these thoughts. Mm-hmm. And so that has nothing to do with realism. That's a belief. That's right. That's why, man, you enjoy philosophy, right? I think so. <laughs> And we can confuse her. Look at the back of her. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I have really enjoyed it. I, Thank I, you. I, I don't want to leave here and thinking, is there something I didn't ask? We better get it up quick. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I got any notes here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, uh, why do you think some people are stereotyped? Well, because they take, uh, as, as an actor, you take a certain part. And you say, that's the way the people that I've seen acted. And they say, we want you to be this character or that character. And so you just look at people that you know, and that's how they stereotype you. That suddenly you are that, that person. It may not be anything like you, but it's the actor you play. I think it's the, the better you are at it, the more stereotyped you can get. Well, yeah, because you can get a lot more. You can be one stereotype, but the hard part is, is stepping out of them. When you when you've done one, yeah. and then you say, "Oh, wait a minute, I'm going to do this one." People say, "No, that's not you. I want to see the other you." And the other you is could be whatever. Mm-hmm. Like say Lamont on for Sanford and Son, mm-hmm. I couldn't see him in any other role, right? Yeah. Or Jethro Bodine. Well, but they but they all are because they're actors. That's what you got to realize mm-hmm. that they're not. That's not the real them. Just like when I talk to you now, but if you if I told you to have a different kind of a accent that you were somebody else Mm -hmm. just for a few minutes to do a show Mm -hmm. you could do that and you would be i don't know if i could you could anybody can it's easy you just take on so you look at them they show you a picture of them maybe show you a film of other people Mm -hmm. that act in that way and you say oh yeah i can see that he moves his hands here he doesn't look at you when he talks to you he's looking down all the time looking up on whatever and you are different people Let me ask you this. I got one more question. Okay. One more question. Let's see. Uh, one thing I that I thought was ingenious about Leave It to Beaver is they announced the actors in the intro. No, no other show that I know has has done that before or since. Hmm. Right. Give me a break. That's I, don't know. I think it was the. One. I think it was that window I was talking about. <laughs> okay. Um, I I don't really know. I mean, you know, they said, you know, yeah. Hugh Beaumont, Barbara Billings, Barbara Tony, Bill, Dow, Tony and Dow, Jerry Mathers, Jerry, as, as the beaver. beaver. And that's that's yeah. the only show that I know that's ever done that. I have no idea. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, but it was way out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. It was something, you know, that's just what we did. We did mm-hmm. went in, they'd give us a script on Monday, we'd read it, mm-hmm. and then the writers would go back and rewrite mm-hmm. it. And Tuesday we came mm-hmm. in and we blocked it, and the next three days we shot it. Um, are you going to do any more acting? 
Maybe. You know, if I see something I like, that's the thing. I mean, you know, a lot of people want me to do uh, beaver, and I, you know, I'm really not, you know, an eight or nine year old boy. Well, couldn't you be the beaver now? I did. I did the new leave to beaver where I played the father, and I had uh -huh. two sons, so. But I mean, couldn't you do the grandfather leave it to beaver? I could, but it's a lot of work. You got to realize when you when you're working on a show like that. I was there at eight in the morning. The kids, I found out, all go home at five o'clock. When you're there as an adult actor, you can be there nine, ten, eleven o'clock at night, and you have to be back the next morning at seven o'clock. So it's a lot of work. I don't mind it if it's a good show, but it's you know and. Be honest with you, I don't really have to work. <laughs> I feel like maybe you owe it to. Well, then you can pay it. You can pay your share then, and we'll start. How much is it? <laughs> you don't want to know. Hey, I really appreciate you coming. Oh, my pleasure. I've had a good time. This is, you are the most, I, I have to say, I'm starstruck. Oh, thank you. You have a beautiful place here. I mean, it's easy. I really do. It I, really I is. Know. I really. Do. <laughs> you're not. You don't have to tell I'm me. I'm gonna show you around when we get done here. Okay. I can. I can tell though. It's a really nice place. And you have got a really nice wife. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> Jerry, I, I can't. Know. I cannot thank you.